Oh, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, service tonight. We're doing things a little bit differently. We're in person and uh, online as well tonight. So, uh, welcome to those who are here in person. Welcome to those uh, who are watching from their homes. Uh, it's great to be together as God's people to be able to worship uh, Him tonight. As we come to do that, let's start by praying. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this chance to be Your people uh, we thank you that our restrictions have eased somewhat so that we can have uh, an in-person service, but we thank you also for the technology to be able to watch at home. We do pray that as we spend this time now, you would help us to free ourselves of other distractions and to focus on you, Lord. Help us, uh, uh, help us to uh, sing your praises, help us to hear and to learn from your word, and help us to e be encouraged, Lord, by our meeting together. Uh, Lord, we pray that everything that would be done tonight would be for your glory and that through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we have so many uh, varied reasons to uh, praise God uh, in the good and the joyous moments of life, but as well as in the uh, hard times. There's so many reasons to praise Him. Uh, so we're going to sing our first song now, 10,000 Reasons. Please sing with us.
short moment, we're going to read from the Bible. But before we do, I want to read from 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is inspired for God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. So that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Please continue to sing and pray essentially this next song, Speak, O Lord. And uh, those who are at home, perhaps to get your Bibles out, I'm going to invite Kiel forward to bring our first reading before Sky comes up uh, and reads as well. Well, we continue the uh, great 
biography of Paul and the early church as recorded by Luke. Tonight, we're reading from the 17th chapter of Acts. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men have caused trouble all over the world and have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we also thank God continuously because of when you received the word of God, which you have, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of the, of God, which is indeed at work in you, which who believe for you, brothers and sisters became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You have suffered your own people the same things these churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they also heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has become upon them at last. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphanized by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crowd in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, we are the glory and joy. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, everybody. It looks like suddenly there's a whole lot more people than there were when I first came in the church. So welcome to you all and to those at home. As we come to look at God's word, let us pray. Lord our God, thank you that we can gather here to sing about your greatness and to hear your word. And we pray that tonight you will open our hearts and our minds so that we might hear your word know it and put it into practice in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Paul and his companions travelled from city to city and town to town, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, they were assisted in places by by the Romans' enormous networks of roads. And some of these were so well built that they are still 
around today, 2,000 years later. And last week, you remember that Matt told us about what happened in Philippi, how God called people to faith through their ministry, even when they had been beaten and thrown into jail. On leaving Philippi, Paul and Silas went by the Via Ignatia, or the Ignatian Way. It was a main highway that went from the west of the very western part of Turkey across Greece to the coast where ships would then go to Italy. And on this road, as we see in our reading today, Paul and Silas passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia and then came to Thessalonica, which was the major city of that region. And unlike Philippi, they had a synagogue, which means they must have had a significant number of Jews. We know that when Paul entered a city, it was his practice to go first to the Jews, and he did that here and went to the synagogue. We read that for three Sabbath days, Paul argued with the Jews from the scriptures, explaining how and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to die, to suffer and to rise from the dead. This was not necessarily an easy task because many Jews believed that the Messiah would be a mighty warrior king who would come and get rid of the Romans. And even Jesus' disciples found this a hard thing to accept and they were hearing it from him. And Paul's punchline in this was, this is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Jesus is the one who died for the sins of the world. And God opened the hearts and minds of some of those there, and they became believers in Jesus. As to those who became converts, we're given three groups. The first is the Jews. Now, it says some Jews, which for me, I think, implies that there were more Jews who didn't become believers than there were became believers, and that's important later. Next were the devout Greeks. These were God-fearers who had joined with the Jews at the synagogue in worshipping God, but hadn't taken the much bigger step of converting fully to Judaism. And this seems to be the group who accepted the gospel most of them, because we are told a great many of them believed. And finally were the leading women. Thessalonica was more a Greek city than a Roman city, and so the women of the upper class could be quite influential um, apart from their husbands. And we're told that there were not a few of them who converted. In other words, there were quite a few of them who did. And that sounds great, doesn't it? Paul and Silas have had a significant ministry among them. There are these groups of people who have now become believers. And presumably their plan would be to stay a while longer and help to build the faith of these Thessalonians. However... We go back to those Jews who didn't believe. They became jealous. And it doesn't say exactly why they were jealous, but I think we can assume that it was because people left the synagogue and went to f- and followed Jesus. So Paul and Silas, they've had Greeks and the others in the synagogue, and then suddenly Paul and Silas turn up and rather than being attached to the synagogue, suddenly they're not. And because of this, the Jews acted. As we look at what the Jews did in Acts, as we read today, I want to compare that with what the Jews in Jerusalem did to Jesus, because there's actually a lot of similarities. Firstly, both cases were caused by jealousy. We know that from um, Acts in Thessalonica. And in Mark's Gospel, it reads, For Pilate realised that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him 
Jesus. The jealousy in both cases was caused by people believing in Jesus and becoming followers. So Jesus, when he was alive, he had his own disciples and others who followed him. And Paul and Silas had spoken and people became followers of Jesus. In both cases as well, the Jews disagreed with the message. The Jerusalem didn't, Jews didn't like that Jesus criticised them and portrayed himself as God. And the Thessalonian Jews didn't like that Paul and Silas taught that Jesus was the suffering Messiah. And I'll go into that a little more shortly. Next, the Jews in both cases used a crowd to get their way. So in Jerusalem was the crowd who, whipped up by the chief priests, were going, crucify him, crucify him. And the, most of that crowd, I would assume, would have been Jewish, which is kind of better than the Jews in Thessalonica because they went to the marketplace and got these ruffians and started a riot. And these ruffians would have thought, yeah, good old riot. And they see the they came and they would drag Jason out um, to the authorities. Now, quick side note here. Jason was apparently the one where Paul and Silas stayed with while they were in Thessalonica. So when Paul and Silas couldn't be found, they grabbed him and the others instead. Next up, neither group of Jews had the authority and power to get rid of their nemesis. So they used a secular authority to carry out their wishes. In Jerusalem, they asked Pilate to do it, to have Jesus put to death because they couldn't do it themselves. And in Thessalonica, the Jews went into the city officials to have Paul and Silas run out of town. And this leads to the, most, to the last and most significant similarity. The reason that both group gave so that the authorities would do what they wanted to was that Jesus was being proclaimed king instead of Caesar. Think about that for a minute. The Jews generally hated the Roman authorities and the emperor who'd set himself up as God so they wouldn't swear allegiance to him. But here they put those same authorities on the spot by saying they had to act to crucify Jesus and to force Paul and Silas out because Jesus was being proclaimed king, not Caesar. How convenient. Hate them, but use them when you want to. And this final similarity shows that it, the Jews in Jerusalem and Thessalonica knew what the proclamation was about. They heard the message and knew that it said that Jesus was king. And even though they knew it, they rejected it. And this is the crux of the matter. There will be people who reject the message without really understanding it, and so they reject in ignorance. But this was not the Jews. They acted knowingly and purposefully. And as much as they hated the Romans, both groups of Jews would rather accept a Roman Caesar as king than a suffering Messiah as king. And that is why they pushed the Roman authorities in Jerusalem and in Thessalonica. They knew that any possibility of insurrection had to be stopped or the army of Rome would come to shut, them, to shut it down. And nobody wanted that, neither in Jerusalem or Thessalonica. And so we have this connection between the Jerusalem Jews' rejection of Jesus and the Thessalonican Jews' rejection of Paul and Silas. And that rejection goes on. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, comparing them with the Judean churches, 
as they both suffered opposition from unbelievers around them. And of course, it still goes on today. In many places and times, there have been churches persecuted by those who have knowingly and deliberately rejected Jesus. So we shouldn't be surprised by this opposition because Jesus himself told us that the world would hate believers. In John 15, he says, If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world will love you as its own because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. And you can see this so clearly in Thessalonica. When they were joined to the synagogue, they were not opposed. They were part of them. But when they became believers and were joined to Jesus, they faced great opposition. And they were no longer of the world. And so the world hated them. So we come to the point where Paul and Silas had to leave. And they had to leave in a hurry. They didn't have time to do anything before they left. The news this last week showing the aftermath of the floods and the storms that we have seen across Victoria. Homes damaged or flooded, power outages lasting days. And it seemed that it happened quickly with very little notice. Particularly with the floods, they may have been able to put sandbags down to protect areas or to move all things to a higher point where they hopefully wouldn't get flooded. And even that they could evacuate and have the valuable things with them. When you know that something is going to happen, you can prepare for it. But when something happens suddenly, you have to take it as it comes. Paul and Silas had to leave everything as it was, including and especially a group of new believers facing opposition. I think if Paul and Silas had a chance, they would have prepared the church to keep going and growing without them. They would have taught them more to make sure they knew the truth and could resist false teaching when it arose and made sure they had strong leadership. But they just had to leave. Bang. This part of Paul's message, mission, will continue next week as we read on in Acts. But for us now, there are a couple of things to think about. Firstly is the power of God's word. Paul used the scriptures, which is, of course is God's word, to argue, explain and to prove that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead and deal with sin and that that Messiah was Jesus. And people believed. Paul wrote in his letter to the Thessalonians, when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, God's word, which also is at work in you, believers. Paul spoke God's word. The Thessalonians accepted his teaching as God's word and God's word was at work within them, giving them faith and growing their faith and sustaining them in face of opposition. God's word hasn't stopped. It's still proclaimed. It's still believed. It still works to people, bring people to believe and it still works in the lives of believers. And when we immerse ourselves in God's word, it works in us. It strengthens our faith. It helps us to know what is truth and what isn't truth. When we read and study it together, it draws us closer to one another. And we become stronger as a church and more able to help one another. And secondly is opposition. As I've said, throughout the entire history of the church, there have been believers 
groups of believers like the Thessalonians who face, have faced op- opposition and persecution. Some have been imprisoned for their faith and some have been martyred for their faith. We're fortunate here because Australia is a relatively safe place. We can still gather together openly to worship God and are still able to share our faith, to share the love that God has for all. There are still here those who oppose us, who don't just disagree with us, they stubbornly refuse to accept that Jesus is the suffering Messiah who prayed, paid for our sins and that he is Lord. This is the result of a heart hardened against God. And I'll talk more about that next week. There are also those who don't believe because they don't understand. And if you are like that, please be in touch with us here at St Mary's because we would love to have you know the good news of Jesus. This is the same good news that many people all over the world have accepted and it's the same good news that was accepted by the church at Thessalonica. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul and Silas and how they kept going no matter what happened to them, that you gave them the strength to do it. We thank you for places like Thessalonica where the church was able to grow even under opposition and hate. We pray for those with hard hearts. We pray that those hearts will be softened and we pray that you will help us as we continue our walk with you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. invite us to stand if you're here and you might even like to stand at home if you're at home feel like you're here with us Uh, and we're going to sing our next song this i believe
prayer. I'm going to lead us. Uh, it's been my privilege tonight. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this world in which we live. We thank you that your uh, beauty, that your majesty is revealed in creation. But Lord, we lament that so many things are not as they ought to be. So we lift to you now all our concerns, all those things which trouble us. Lord, we especially pray for those places around the world where peace is not the day to day, where that's caused by warfare, Lord, by conflict. We pray that you, the Prince of Peace, would be at work. Lord, we pray that you would give our restraint in the just use of force. We pray, Lord, that you would be at work amongst leaders, helping them to work towards peace. Lord, we pray for your justice to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, we lift to you those nations around the world that are currently really grappling with uh, the pandemic. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy on them, that you would relent, that you would preserve life, Lord. We pray for those who make decisions in regards to public health. We pray that you would uh, help them, Lord, to make wise decisions. We pray that you would raise up uh, countries that are doing better to be more generous with those things that they have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you that you've called a people in all times, in all places, from every uh, tribe, nation and tongue, Lord. We thank you that you gather us together, particularly tonight, but all around the world today. So many different people, millions of people, come to worship you through faith in the Lord Jesus. So we thank you for that rich diversity, Lord. But we pray for the church and for its mission. We pray, Lord that as the world sort of enveloped in all of this strife at the moment, Lord, you would empower your church to be a, a, a massive presence of light in the, uh, in the whole world, Lord. We pray that in the darkness we would point people to the light of Christ, that people would come to know Jesus in their millions, Lord. We pray that especially here in Sunbury, that you would be at work uh, not only in us but in all the churches of Sunbury, Lord. Help us to fulfil your mission here. Help us to uh, have opportunities to share Jesus with others. Give to us courage to fight that fear uh, that might come when we have those opportunities. And help us, Lord, to faithfully proclaim the immense love that you've shown to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we lift you tonight, all those who are in any sorrow, trouble, sickness, grief or any other need, Lord. Lord, be very near to them. Lord, heal them, but above all, give to them a firm trust in your goodness and your love. Lord, equip us, raise us up and others to be able to care for those in need. Lord, bring all of us one day into that joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So, Lord, we commit these prayers to you, thanking you for the immense privilege of being able to come before you, the King and Creator of the universe, with our requests. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and if you're at home uh, and have those things uh, ready, then uh, that's wonderful. If not, you might have a a brief chance now to get some bread and either some wine or grape juice and uh, be able to participate uh, along with us uh, here in person. But regardless, we're going to come now to a time uh, where we have an opportunity to confess our sin before God. Uh, And we do that because we're reminded by St. Paul that as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He says, therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of Christ. He says to then examine ourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So what I'm going to do now is give us all an opportunity to do exactly that, to examine ourselves, to bring those things before God, which we may have failed with in the past week. And then we're going to pray together in a prayer of confession. Friends, knowing the goodness of God, yet our failure to respond with love and obedience 
Let's confess our sins together, praying, Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the good news, the the great news of the Gospel is that God is slow to anger and he is full of compassion, forgiving all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. God therefore forgives us in Christ Jesus, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. What a wonderful truth that is. That's that which we come to celebrate in just a moment. Now, for those who are here tonight, uh, there's uh, a number of us here that we're able to bring it to you in your seats. Uh, So what I'll do is uh, I'll bring around the bread, and then Ros is going to follow me uh, with uh, these trays, which have little cups of grape juice in them. They're all grape juice tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask you to take the little cup, but not drink it yet. Because what we're going to do is we're going to drink it all together, uh, along with those people at home, so that we can feel like we're doing it all together. So get the bread, eat that first. Uh, That's fine, eat that separately. Uh, But when we come to the grape juice, just hold on to that and we'll do it together. And Nathaniel, I might ask you to click through the slides if that's okay for me. Thank you. Well, friends, the Lord be with you. you. Lift up your your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. Oh, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, making us in your own image. We give you thanks for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, gracious God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who receive them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, in accordance with our Saviour's word and in remembrance of his suffering and death, may share his body and blood. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread and when he had given you thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So tonight we eat this bread and we drink this cup to proclaim the death of the Lord and we do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus. Mm. Well, Father, as we recall his saving death and his glorious resurrection, may we who share these gifts be renewed by your Holy Spirit and united in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, there to feast at your table and to join in your eternal praise. For worthy is a lamb who is slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Well, come, let's take this sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us. And let's feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat this in remembrance of Christ died for you. Now be thankful. Close. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Ooh, that's right, we'll do that together. Wonderful. Lucky Ros was on the board. Uh, and for those at home, if you have some bread, you might like to take that now. And remember that this is the body of Christ which was given for you. Preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Amen. You might go up here first. Take and eat this in remembrance of Christ died for you. I'll be thankful.
all of us here now and uh, those at home that have some grape juice or some wine, now would be the chance to uh, take that. And remember, this is the blood of Christ and may it keep us all in eternal life. Amen. A wonderful uh, thing a couple of weeks ago uh, from another preacher. And he was talking about Revelation and uh, the Lamb, Jesus being the Lamb there. And he said, the only thing that can save you from the wrath of the Lamb is the blood of the Lamb. How true is that? The only thing that can save us from the wrath of the Lamb is the blood of the Lamb. And in that meal, we've just celebrated that wonderful truth that if we believe in Jesus, we are saved from that coming wrath. What a wonderful thing to celebrate and to know and to cherish. And I pray that each of us know that and go out into the world uh, trusting in that. Well, there's no particular announcements uh, tonight other than uh, just to keep an eye on your emails. Uh, Gavin will send an email out during the week. Uh, We hope to clarify exactly what will be happening next week. Uh, Who knows, really? Let's see what happens. Uh, Do check your emails, though, uh, and uh, and it'll be great to have some of us here uh, if we can. Otherwise, uh, we'll we'll do what we need to do. I'm sure we'll be right. Uh, But we're going to sing our final uh, song now, All Glory Be to Christ. The only thing that can save us from the wrath of the Lamb is the blood of the Lamb. Let's give that glory back to God. Sing with us. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy
brings our time together to a close. But I want to finish by reading from Revelation 7. After this I looked and there was a great multitude and no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and around the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's the future we have to look forward to, worshipping God forever. And I pray that as we go out into the world this week, we can do exactly that here on earth, looking forward to that day when we do it in heaven. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great week. I'll see you again next week.